here. I'm a doctor of natural medicine and today I'm here to share one of the best success stories I have personally witnessed. This is about a patient I started to see about three months ago. She is a nurse and her name is Alex. When I started seeing her, her GFR was 28 and she was really worried about that. And now after just three months, let's see what she has to say. She's a nurse. She's called Alex and I'll read you a comment she wrote. I know I'm the nurse here, but you really nursed me back to health with all your advice and assistance. My GFR was sitting at a sorry 28 and now it's up to 57. Practically did a jig in my living room when I heard that. Okay, guys, that's absolutely incredible. This is the kind of result that would make a lab technician redo all the blood work. But wait, there is more. I'll read it to you. And I managed to put on five pounds, which might not sound like much to whippersnappers, but these old girls thrilled. And my arthritis was giving me fits for years, but it's finally easing up. It's like a weight's been lifted off my shoulders. I believe the detoxifier you prescribed me is really working. Oh, and I'm sorry if I bombarded you with all those messages before Christmas. But you know me, I'm always anxious about all the food stuff, especially since my regular doc wasn't uh, exactly helpful. He didn't even want to adjust my tenormin despite the paper you sent. Don't worry about that, Alex. You know, I'm always here to help. And guys, every time I share a success story, people ask exactly what the patient did. Since nurse Alex gave me permission to share part of her treatment, you'll learn more about her diet, the supplements she's taking, and also about a particular detoxifier I recommended her. So first of all, let's focus on how on earth can a CKD patient go from a GFR of 28 to 57 in just three months. Was it a mix-up at the clinic? A malfunctioning machine? Nope, it's all thanks to Alex's hard work and dedication in changing her lifestyle and diet. Huge congratulations again, Alex, on your improvement! Let's see how her treatment works starting with a peculiar challenge she gave me. No, it wasn't answering messages on Christmas Eve. I mean, you know me, guys. I'll take any excuse to duck out of family gatherings. Shh, not tell anyone. No, the challenge was something called medication reconciliation, which is just a fancy way of saying I had to double check that none of her prescribed drugs was wrecking her kidneys. So yeah, this is a bit like trying to solve a jigsaw puzzle where half the pieces are shaped like pills and the other half are shaped like insurance claims. In any case, when I take on a new patient, one of the first things I do is double check every single medication and supplements they use. And fortunately, Nurse Alex wasn't taking anything outright harmful like a proton pump inhibitor like Prilosec or even worse, an end state like ibuprofen or aspirin. Yeah, that happens. However, something in her list of medications made my spider sense tingle. In fact, she was taking Tenormin or Atenolol 100 mg a day, which is a high dose. Now, this blood pressure medication is pretty common. Atenolol is a beta blocker which is often prescribed in combination with other antihypertensive, especially when the patient is suffering from high blood pressure due to stress or when heart issues are also present. However, adenolol comes with a risk because you see, this medication is cleared by the kidneys, which means that when kidney function is reduced, the dose needs to be adjusted. She was taking 100 mg a day and that's two times the maximum dose, not safe. I had to change the dose for that medication. Now, telling someone a medication their doctor gave them is bad for their kidneys is a huge deal. Someone made a mistake and someone else is probably going to get mad. But you see, 
there is a pretty extensive list of medications that need to be adjusted when CKD progresses. And frankly, I cannot let a patient take the wrong doses and do nothing about it. Because remember this, the kidneys are going to filter all the toxins that are inside your body and medications are always going to be one of the biggest issues here. So the question is, are you taking nephrotoxic medications? There is a long list of medications that should be adjusted when CKD progresses. So if we take a look at this paper, we may see that many blood pressure drugs need to be adjusted if your GFR is below 50. Blood pressure medications such as enalapril, lisinopril, atenolol. Certain diuretics such as spironolactone, same for certain statins such as fluvostatin and more. Patients with diabetes also need to be monitored because medications such as metformin and others need to be adjusted as well. And there is also a long list of medications that are not as commonly used such as antibiotics and NSAIDs that need to be adjusted. Of course, this list doesn't include, you know, all the stuff you are not supposed to take at all if you have CKD. These are just the medications for which your doctor is supposed to reduce the dose when kidney function declines. This is important because trying to achieve an improvement in kidney function when you are taking medications that are damaging your kidneys is like trying to fix a leaky roof while someone's drilling holes in it from the other side. Not exactly conducive to progress. I know, I know, all of this sounds complicated, but dealing with CKD is complicated. But guys, you're not alone in this journey. If you want me to double check your medications and create a personalized treatment plan for you, send me an email. I'm here to help. I offer remote one-on-one -on -one consultations. Through these sessions, I've had the privilege of meeting some amazing people from this community. People who are knowledgeable about their health and determined to make positive changes. And with my guidance, they're taking their health to new levels. And I've decided to free up more time in the coming weeks to help even more of you. If you are looking for answers and a plan that's personalized for you, now's a great time to reach out send me an email to katherine at newhopeforkinnypatients.com and we can talk you'll also find a link in the description to contact me directly speaking of personalized plans there is one thing in particular that i want to show you about alex treatment so she's suffering from gout which is caused by high uric acid there is a medication for that allopurinol which is very effective but like many other medications is cleared by the kidney so she was taking a reduced dose she needed some more help this help came first of all in the form of a better diet more about that later but i also recommended a couple of detoxifiers in order to reduce her uric acid level so question what really works to keep uric acid at bay well first of all you want cherry extract here Cherries are the enemy number one of gout, says science, because they contain a combination of anthocyanins and other flavonoids that are known to inhibit xanthine oxidase. Xanthine is the enzyme responsible for uric acid production. Cherry extract also enhances uric acid excretion via the kidneys. Yeah, a true detoxifier. This warrants a powerful result. Studies say that combining cherries in any form with allopurinol reduces gout flares by a whopping 75%. This is why I recommended Alex taking around 400 mg of 10 to 1 tart cherry extract per day with a meal. This supplement is also known to be safe for CKD patients. Now guys, if you are suffering from gout, you must also understand that this is an inflammatory condition, all right? Which means that you can benefit from certain natural anti-inflammatories. Omega-3 supplementation is the first thing I would recommend here also without gout. But probably antioxidant therapy is what really helps with gout and with CKD in general, I would add. So yeah, antioxidants were maybe my silver bullet in the success with this patient. 
Now, when it comes to antioxidants, what really matters is getting as many as possible and from as many different sources as possible. This is why I recently made a video about the best antioxidants you can find to fight inflammation and kidney disease. It's up here if you missed it. Now guys, when we talk about chronic inflammation, we must understand that this is a serious problem for CKD patients. It could literally be life-threatening in extreme cases, especially if the cause of inflammation is not addressed properly. Now, Nurse Alex in particular came to me complaining of persistent low-grade fevers and unwanted weight loss. And that worried me a lot. Those are symptoms of persistent inflammation, which is something that in some cases may cause rapid loss of kidney function. Now, I will immediately tell you that, of course, her inflammation markers improved a lot and her symptoms as well soon after the treatment was started. This is something we can tell not just because of her improvement in GFR and creatinine, but also because she is gaining weight and having less pain. In fact, it's clear that you can't achieve a better kidney function without reducing inflammation first. So the big question is, are you suffering from inflammation? Well, there are certain symptoms in particular you should pay attention to. Some common signs and symptoms of inflammation that you should watch out for include persistent low-grade fevers. This is always one of the biggest red flags for inflammation, joint or muscle pain. Remember that inflammation often causes pain. Swollen joints are often another sign of inflammation. Fatigue, loss of appetite, and headaches are also common. Now, if we look at the symptoms on screen, what some may think is that this looks a lot like having the flu, doesn't it? Because of course, the flu causes a lot of inflammation in the body as well. But that's acute, not chronic. So if you have some flu-like symptoms that don't go away, get tested. No, not for the flu. Get your C-reactive protein, serum albumin, and ferritin tested. These levels could tell your doctor if you are in fact experiencing chronic inflammation. CRP is our indicator here, but also having low serum albumin with elevated ferritin is a strong indicator of chronic inflammation. Actually, get tested even without symptoms. Many CKD patients have what's called subclinical inflammation, which is only detectable through laboratory markers. Still worth looking into because, as I was saying, inflammation causes fast kidney damage, like it was happening to nurse Alex. So this patient was risking a rapid loss of kidney function, not on my watch, I said. I needed a strategy and I needed it quickly. So let's talk about our main weapon against the progression of kidney disease and against inflammation. Who knows what that is? Well, the answer is, drum roll please, the low protein plant-based renal diet. Okay, okay, I know that I sound like a broken record when I talk about the renal diet, but if you think an improvement of GFR from 28 to 57 in a CKD patient is possible without a low-protein plant-based diet, well, prove it. Seriously, if anyone could prove that this kind of improvement is possible without a diet, well, write a paper about it, get published you'll get nominated for a Nobel Prize. Really, it'll be titled The Day Bargers Healed the Nephron. The Day Bargers Healed the Nephrons. Anyway, we have not found a diet-free cure for CKD yet. The best thing we have today is the renal diet, especially if it's a well-designed one. In the case of Nurse Alex, the goal was clear. Cut protein intake and increase caloric intake. How do we do that? Now, when most people think about the whole concept of diet, they associate it with weight loss. But what if someone who is already underweight still needs to start a diet? Can I recommend them, you know, to eat cake, cookies, potato chips, and soda every day until correct body weight is restored? Well, no, I can't. Cakes have dairy, no good for the kidneys. Potato chips are super inflammatory. Sodas are full of phosphorus. Cookies, um, well, yeah, you could actually eat upper day cookies if you can find them. I mean, they do make cookies for kidney patients, but they also charge you like 14 euros per box plus shipping, of course. So your new weight gain diet will be pretty expensive. 
Anyway, if you'd ask Nurse Alex, she will tell you, no, I got no cookies in my diet. So what foods can I recommend a kidney disease patient that are low in protein but high in calories? Well, the very first recommendation here is olive oil. Because trust me, if you need to keep your body weight on and to fight inflammation, there is nothing better than olive oil. First of all, olive oil is one of the most powerful anti-inflammatories you can add to your dishes. Research found out that a daily dose of 50 grams or 4 tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil has 10% of the pain relief effect of a daily dose of ibuprofen, but 0% percent of the kidney damaging effect of ibuprofen in fact olive oil is so powerful at fighting the inflammation it is actually considered the main reason why the mediterranean diet is so good for you and guys keep in mind that olive oil is completely protein free all right this is incredibly important for us because if the goal is increasing caloric intake and decreasing protein intake this food is your best friend and of course there are other oils that have kidney protecting properties such as avocado oil flaxseed oil and coconut oil something else that can really help here is something else that can really help here are seeds flax seeds in particular now <laughs> Now, while seeds do have some protein, which means you must eat them in moderation, this small seed is still amazing at protecting the kidneys in people with inflammatory kidney disease. There are studies showing that flaxseed can improve GFR in many patients. This is why flaxseed is one of the most recommended seeds for people with kidney disease. It's also a decent source of selenium, a key mineral for kidney health. Flaxseed also contains vitamin B6, iron, and vitamin B1 in significant amounts, not to mention the omega-3s. Now, since in the case of Nurse Alex, the cause for the inflammation was mainly her reduced caloric intake, I also recommended a list of other high calories, low protein foods, fruits, rich in fats, just avocados, coconuts, and olives are great in this case. Nut butters such as almond, peanut, or cashew are also calorie dense, even if they contain some protein. But hey, trust me when I say that only eating oil and flaxseed gets boring quickly. And of course, our main staple when it comes to getting more calories without introducing too much protein is white rice. And I get it, many people don't like it when I talk about white rice. But you see, white rice has a unique benefit. It has less protein per 100 grams compared to basically any other staple food. Now guys, if you want to know more about how to get more calories but without getting more protein, my video up here is for you and this is all for today. Thank you for watching. God bless you all. Bye-bye.